us join in our order of confession and forgiveness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have not done. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare unto you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. prayer of the day. Let us pray. Bend your ear to our prayers, Lord Christ, and come among us. By your gracious life and death for us, bring light into the darkness of our hearts and anoint us with your spirit. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's work might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. 
Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva, and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. Then he went and washed and came back, able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is, is he. Others were saying, no, but, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, Then, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus, made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put mud on my eyes, then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, how can, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son? Who you say was born blind, how then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But we do not know how it is now that he sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is our age, he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give the glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciples, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses. But as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We do not, we, we know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born entirely in sins, and what are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. The Gospel of the Lord. 
Praise to you, O Christ. Hi, everyone. So I will be doing the children's sermon today. And since I can't talk with you, I'm going to talk at you. But I wanted to use a piece of paper to talk about what I want you guys to learn. So uh, when I was in like third grade, uh, when I, in my classroom, I had a fiasco happen where I had a incident with a pencil and I hurt my hand. Um, at the time, it felt very hopeless and that there really would um, not be a lot of good things to come from it because I really had hurt my hand. So to help me feel better, my teacher asked me to do something. And she asked me to try to fit through a piece of paper. Um, and obviously, if you look at this, it seems pretty impossible for that to happen. Granted, when I was in third grade, I was a lot smaller, uh, but I still tried to do it anyway. So at first, I took the piece of paper and I tried to cut through like the frame out, okay? And as you can see, the size of a piece of paper, that really did not work. But after a lot of trying, I kind of just gave up. And realistically, the reason I did that was because it seemed pretty impossible. And if you look at this piece of paper, see if you look at it, it's not that big. It's a very normal piece of paper. And really, I just gave up pretty easily because sometimes things are just impossible to do. At least that's what I thought. Uh, but so my teacher then ended up showing me, as well as the rest of the class, because of course they got involved as well uh, in trying to fit through this piece of paper. So my teacher, she showed me, and she took a scissors, okay, and you guys can do this at home, by the way, too, but I'll, and I'll walk through what I actually do. Um, but she took this piece of paper, and she cut strips in the paper, and she started on the folded edge, okay, on the crease, and she began to cut strips. And when she did, she did tell me about um, things that usually seem impossible. And a lot of times, things that are impossible probably are impossible. But a lot of times, you can also figure out how to make them possible. Uh, I think that this really relates pretty well to today, uh, because I know most of us right now are kind of stuck at home. Uh, in isolation because our, well, I mean, a lot of us are on spring break right now, and I do get that. But the reason we're at home is because there's a lot of kind of tough things happening in the world today uh, with the coronavirus and everything that's happening. So I want to give this to you so you guys can learn that not everything is, like that uh, there are things that are possible even when they seem impossible. All right, so first, you're gonna have this cut, and it looks kind of like a piano or like a, like a hula skirt maybe, uh, but you have this floppy strips, okay? So then that is the first thing that you'll do, you cut, and you wanna make sure that these cuts do not go up to the top of the page, all right? Then the next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna flip it over and you're gonna make cuts the exact same as you did before, okay? But so starting with the end, you do not wanna cut these two end pieces, all right? But then you will cut in the middle of the strips, all right? And you'll do the same thing where you will not cut all the way up to the top, but you'll cut in between the strips. And it helps to make sure that these um, folds are pretty accurate, but not everyone is perfect, so it is okay to not have it be perfect. Uh, but anyway, I think that it is important for all of us right now to remember that just because things seem impossible, so maybe you're uh, worried about getting sick or you are concerned that you um, won't be able to work when you're at home or you're worried you're not gonna be able to learn if you're in school. And so a lot of times we're gonna look at these situations, especially like today, that there is not really a possible solution and we're just gonna have to wait, okay? But there's something that I also want you guys to remember, especially because I'm at church right now, so it's important to think about this, but God does make things possible. Uh, there's a lot of situations in the Bible in which Jesus and God both make a lot of impossible seeming situations become possible uh, based on people trusting Jesus, especially uh, like situations like when Jesus walks on water, Jesus actually helps others walk on water too. And that's something that seems super impossible, right? But trusting in Jesus, it helped them walk on water. So after you have these cuts, your paper will look like this. 
okay? Then you're gonna take the end that is still folded, okay, the creased end, and it'll look like this, okay? So you're gonna cut these creased ends, and you're gonna slide your scissors through, and you're gonna make cuts, so then it ends up separating, all right? And this part is definitely a little uh, harder. And I'm sure you guys are wondering what I am doing right now because, and it can get a little messy. Hopefully I'm not gonna make a mistake. Um, and I'm sure you're also realizing that something that definitely seemed super impossible is beginning to become more possible. Where is my, okay. I made a big one. But anyway, as this looks start, begins to look more like a snowflake, you will start seeing that I am beginning to make kind of a circle. And actually, when, because I am a lot bigger than I was when I was in third grade, I was not confident that this was going to work because I didn't know how big I needed to make it. But then the very first one I did, I ended up making insanely big and I ripped it on my shoe when I tried stepping through it because these uh, little things were actually pretty uh, flimsy. But as I get to the end here, you will see that I made a huge circle <laughs> and I can step through it like that. So something that seemed super impossible actually became possible and I just got caught myself. Became possible through cutting. And that's what I want you guys to remember too, that even though sometimes things will seem impossible, make sure you remember and pray to God that, and if you wait long enough, answers will happen and things will become possible. Oh, and actually, will you guys pray with me? And I'm sorry, I can't be able to get, won't be able to give you candy, but hopefully your parents can maybe give you some because you did this with them. All right, but let us pray. Uh, dear God, thank you for making the impossible possible. Uh, thank you for being here with us during this uh, harder time and just keep giving us the strength to continue on. And uh, yeah, we know you love us. So in your name we pray. Amen. Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the giver and sustainer of our faith, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Eric gave us a nice message of joy. Uh, last week, Christine Marks and her daughter Sydney uh, told me of how they begin each day sharing something that they are thankful for. Dan Schreer wanted to share a bit of joy that his favorite piano performer, Jim McDonough, is doing uh, performances on Facebook Live on Tuesdays and Fridays. And someone shared on Facebook how one inventive priest got a picture of all of his parishioners, individual pictures, printed them, and then put them on each of the chairs in the sanctuary so that when he looked at the congregation, he could see their faces. I invite you to continue to share your joy with each other, especially with those who are not connected with the internet. Make a phone call, have a conversation, and stay connected with each other because we are in a time of crisis and we are making meaning out of what is happening. And we are given this beautiful word from John's gospel that will help us to listen to Jesus, to listen to Jesus in that a joy ratio of three to one, although maybe it's a Jesus ratio of three to one. So 
For everything you hear in the news or on the internet or in conversation with others, will you listen to Jesus three times more as you make meaning out of what is happening in our world today and what God is up to in the midst of it. I am glad that you're here today listening to God's word and worshiping God. I hope that seeing the familiar place where we come together helps and hearing some familiar pieces of liturgy and hymns will help you to focus on what God is doing as we are making meaning, as we are sorting through and processing this crisis that we are living in. We will trust Jesus, and Jesus trusts us and counts on us to be a witness of what we know about God we are right in the midst of crisis and making meaning of what is happening. If this works, if social distancing and all the other measures work to flatten the line to reduce a slot of infections coming in at one time, it'll feel like overkill. It'll feel like we've blown it out of proportion. But the thing is, we just don't know enough right now and we have to wade through all of the information and do the best that we can as we continue to talk to God. Remember the three to one ratio. God knows what is happening, just like Jesus sees the blind man in our gospel lesson. And because Jesus sees the blind man, his disciples also see the blind man and they ask, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus says, neither, but look at what God can do. In these past weeks, we have had a lot of wordplay from being born again, born from above, born anew, living water that becomes a gush of uh, a spring gushing with eternal life. And now today, seeing and sin. In our midweek services, we've been cultivating confession and exploring, and exploring the meaning of sin from Psalm 32, verses 1 to 2. We've, we've thought about transgression and iniquity and deceit and sin, probably the most common one of all. But you have to know, in John's Gospel, words always have a little bit more. Where sin means to fail or to miss the goal, anytime you come across sin in John's gospel, you also have to think that sin means a little bit different, a little bit more. Just like we have different names for this virus and the flu and the meanings we associate with them. Some are funny and some are not so funny. But whenever you hear the word sin in this gospel, think not just about missing the mark, and, but think about missing the mark in that we are not believing or trusting God. Because the whole purpose of John's gospel, it is written so that we would believe. It is written so that we would trust. This story of the healing of the blind man is to help us to trust Jesus. And we need that right now. The healed blind man goes through an amazing transformation as he simply tells what Jesus has done for him. And as he does that, he begins to see more and more clearly and he trusts Jesus more and more. We don't hear anything from the disciples except for their first question. We hear from neighbors who invite the Pharisees and parents and try to make meaning and discern what is going on. We want to make meaning out of what is happening in our world. We crave it. As we make meaning, we hear different messages and we argue and we disagree and we discern, and this is normal. This is what we do when something is important to us, when we value it. We value life, we value our health. We value do not harm. I don't want to share something with you that could harm you or hurt you. We love our neighbors 
and we love God. And so it's demonstrated in how we act and how we work together. The neighbors that we meet in our gospel want at first to make sure that this person who is now healed is the same person that they've always known as the blind beggar. And then once that is established, they bring him to the Pharisees because they need to know what this means, that this blind man is healed and he's healed on the Sabbath. And this is where it gets complicated and where values matter. Being an observant Jew matters. The Pharisees, they all agree that Jesus is not observant. They argue about the Sabbath. Sabbath matters. And what one can do and what they can't do matters. So an obviously good outcome, healing, comes, but it is practiced on the Sabbath. And that creates a tension that is worth thinking about and even arguing about. This ritual of thinking hard together keeps the community clear about how one might live faithfully. It is why the neighbors bring the healed man to the Pharisees. They want the best thought the neighborhood could produce. These good thinkers, the Pharisees, disagree and they argue. Here there is disagreement and argument, which is normal for faithful people to do to work out the proper course of action. Argument becomes a gift from God as they discern what God is up to and remain a community of integrity and faithfulness. It is why I consult with staff and executive committee when making decisions about our community. I think we need the best thinking we can produce. It's why I listen to the bishop and my colleagues. And I know that during a crisis, we want to do what we can. As this crisis continues to unfold, I don't know, the hospital may need our help. And so I hope we are in the position to offer it. You may need to come here and pray, and so we'll try to keep the building open until we'll, we are told otherwise. For our gospel lesson, the people there, if they didn't care about the faithfulness, they wouldn't argue. If they didn't love God and their neighbor, they wouldn't argue. They disagreed. The healed blind man is directed to give glory to God because the healing is from God. But Jesus remains the problem. He is a sinner because he's doing God's work on the Sabbath. How can that be? Because God rested on the Sabbath and directed others to do the same. As the conversation continues, the healed blind man grows in his understanding of Jesus. And those who know the most about God have the hardest time seeing God in their very midst, recognizing God in the flesh, in Jesus. The healed blind man gets thrown out, which happens when a terrific argument is offered unexpectedly. The best thinkers need time to sort it through. And you know, if you're one of those good thinkers, open your Bibles, read the rest of this wonderful discussion, which ends in John 10, 21. Some of the Pharisees are willing to see healing as divine acts. And some go back to identifying themselves with Moses, who was in direct contact with God, and who first knew God as the I am. So how can one who is sent from God violate the Sabbath? They want to know what all of this means, just as we want to make meaning out of what is happening in our world today. And it's a good argument. Order is better than disorder. The God who created the universe observes the Sabbath. We ought to. Who do we think we are? Unless, of course, we think we're doing something more important than creating the universe. Healing is evidence. 
God resting on the Sabbath is evidence. Both statements are true. This is discipleship. This is preparation for what is coming for Jesus and for the disciples, because they will be the witnesses of Jesus' death and resurrection. If you want to understand Jesus' interpretation of the miracle of this sign, then read through John 21. They're trying to make sense, make meaning out of the healing and what it points to. For them, they are living in unprecedented times. They have never been through this before, kind of like us. We haven't been through this before. Will we recognize God's presence with us? They were asked to trust that God came to them in the flesh of Jesus. It was hard, just like it is hard for us today to keep trusting Jesus, to keep turning to Jesus, to keep that Jesus ratio of three to one. What happens when we stay with Jesus in whatever news we hear and in whatever meaning we are making of what is happening in our lives? We know that this virus kills people. We know that we may not all survive. There will be meaning to make. This is discipleship. Jesus sees the blind man. Jesus sees in the blind man not just someone who needs to be healed, but he sees a disciple, a disciple who can learn and can trust Jesus so that he can witness to others. Jesus sees us, sees our brokenness, sees our potential as his disciples and our witness, and he counts on us. This cross that I wear, I wear it every season of Lent because it always reminds me of how I am being shaped in the baptismal waters and prepared for Jesus' death and resurrection. And on the back of it, it has the words, Jesus counts on you. And so I wear that close because Jesus is counting on me. Just as Jesus found the healed man when he was kicked out of the community, Jesus finds us and our work. Our work is to trust God, trust that God is with us, that the Holy Spirit is breathed into each and every one of us, and he counts on us to trust and to witness, to listen and to act, what is our witness? We know what God has done as we have read it in the Bible. We know the witness of the word becoming flesh and dwelling among us. And we know the Holy Spirit is with us right here, right now. We know that God loves us. And we know we are going to act on it and to make meaning out of the crisis that is before us. Jesus is counting on us. Amen.
our prayers of intercession. Turning our hearts to God, who is gracious and merciful, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. God of insight, open the hearts of the church and the world to all who testify to your deeds of power. Raise up voices in your church that are often silenced or overlooked due to age, gender expression, race, or economic status. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of insight, empower us to care for the land and all living things that dwell in it and beneath it. Provide rich soil for crops to grow, bring rain to land suffering drought, protect hills and shorelines from damage caused by erosion. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of insight, bring peace to all people and nations. Anoint leaders who seek goodness, righteousness, and truth on behalf of all. Frustrate the efforts of those who would seek to cause violence or terror. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of insight, you care for our needs even before we ask. Come quickly to all who seek prayer this day. Accomplish healing through the work of doctors, nurses, physical therapists, nutritionists, and all who tend to human bodies. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of insight, help this assembly lift up the unique gifts of each person who enters, no matter their physical capacity, cognitive ability, or sensory need. Help us to be creative and brave in making our facilities and our ministries accessible to all. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of insight, you call out to those who are asleep and awaken them to new life. With you, we give thanks for all your saints. Join us together with them as your children in this world and the next. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. According to your steadfast love, O oh God, Hear these and all our prayers as we commend them to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And let us pray together our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. Father. 